Today we're going to take a brief break from our political and foreign policy narrative and look at American culture and change within the 1960s. Because, of course, the 1960s were an incredibly turbulent time, uh, leading to a variety of different uh, traditional forces breaking down and new forces emerging. So we're going to be jumping into counterculture and change. Uh, counterculture is, of course, culture that runs counter to standard culture. And so I'm going to probably, I'll try to find a post of videos here because describing this stuff 100% cannot do it justice. So we're going to talk about, we're going to start out with youth protest. Uh, obviously, young people had a lot of things to be somewhat upset about in the 1950s. Uh, the conformity of the 1950s and this uh, sense of mainstream, everything is fine, culture had hid a series of turbulent issues. And so young people in the, in the 50s got involved in the civil rights movement and in the 60s got involved in trying to fight poverty, of course, and then protest to the Vietnam War. Uh, a lot of, the development of youth culture, of course, always freaks people out. I posted a video, I think, to this. But this, of course, is Elvis Presley, uh, obviously a youth icon. And um, whereas, you know, Chuck Berry created rock and roll or was the one of the founding fathers of rock and roll, Elvis Presley made rock music safe for white people on account of his whiteness. Uh, he made it unsafe for white people on account of his suggestive dancing, which, again, I will put the video in there and... Yeah, you can you can you can take or leave Elvis. That's fine. Uh, the Beatles also, to some extent, represent this new American culture. Uh, despite the fact that they're British, uh, they were incredibly popular in the United States. Uh, they wore their hair long, and uh, they their music became increasingly uh, esoteric as we move forward. We're moving from you know I want to hold your hand to uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. So. Uh, the, pro the progression of the Beatles, to some degree, represents the progression of youth during the 1960s. New Left is the uh, political force behind this. Uh, the New Left is young people getting involved in politics, specifically the Democratic Party, and they become an incredibly important coalition. Uh, the young people of the time become politically active. With these uh, college societies, Students for a Democratic Society was one of the most famous and radical of these. Uh, the documents have the Port Huron statement. You should read it. But it was a manifesto of discontent of youth, of uh, the youth at the time. And so young people are going to want to you know, fight for things like equality, like racial equality, economic equality, uh, more freedom of expression, less sort of... of uh, oppressive monoculture and more of an ability to express themselves. So the new left represents this political shift. And uh, we'll, when we get into review, we'll discuss more if we think this is breaking the, th the fifth party system and moving us into a sixth party system, where the Democrats are not just concerned with economic issues, but also social and cultural ones. Uh, the Berkeley free speech movement was also an important part of this new left. Uh, it represented a breaking out of college students from the sort of traditional stodgy uh, academic environment that they had been raised in. The idea that the college shouldn't just be about rote memorization, but should be about experiences and argument. And students should be exposed to new ideas and be politically active and all this. And, uh, and it was uh, an attempt to sort of crush university codes of conduct that had restricted the activity of college students up to this point, so, which prevented them from being political. So they wanted to become more political, basically. The Vietnam War was also a big component of this, of course. Protesting the Vietnam War was very important for young people on account of they had to go um, you know, fight and die in Vietnam. And we'll talk about that more when we get to the draft and that whole deal tomorrow. But uh, yeah, the new left was also around issues of war and uh, yeah, and foreign policy. Uh, the Summer of Love also represents this counterculture and youth protest. Uh, the Summer of Love was uh, in was in San Francisco. Young people from all over the country descended on the Hate Ashbury district. And it uh, sort of birthed the hippie movement to some extent, this idea that you should be going out and having experiences and not necessarily living this rigidly planned life. And so places like uh, the Haight-Ashbury district of uh, San Francisco or um, the, uh, I can't think of the name of the other place in New York. I'm not going to stop the lecture and go back to it. Uh, you, know, you don't necessarily need to know the, 
the district of New York that became the uh, the hippie central. It's not that important. Uh, the uh, one a part of the hippie movement was pushing back against American culture in general. Uh, this is the bus of the merry pranksters who uh, traveled around the country in a psychedelic bus dosing people with acid with the idea that on LSD you could uh, you could experience the world more purely. So uh, this was also part of the hippie movement, was experimenting with drugs and sort of dropping out of mainstream society. Uh, here we see young people in, in a public park in San Francisco, drum circles, uh, you know, less or more esoteric clothing, uh, dancing, and probably a substantial amount of drugs. Uh, this is a reporter who I believe is trying to interview someone who is high on LSD. Uh, I don't have the actual recording of this interview, but I imagine it was less than coherent. Timothy Leary comes to represent this hippie movement, this new left. Uh, Timothy Leary was a Harvard psychology professor who got way the heck too into acid. And so he would encourage his students to uh, to get high. And then eventually, his uh, the slogan of the Leary movement was, turn on, tune in, drop which did not allow him to continue his uh, Harvard teaching career. So he represents this sort of countercultural movement. Woodstock in uh, the music festival held in uh, New York in 1969 also represented this movement. It was sort of, it's supposed to be sort of a low key music festival and then it grew out of control and there was the rain and the mud and the Jimi Hendrix performing the Star Spangled Banner and the drugs and the sex and all that stuff. Uh, it was supposed to be last year, uh, the 40th anniversary, well, not 40th anniversary, yeah, I guess 40th anniversary, 50th anniversary of Woodstock. They were supposed to have a 50th anniversary concert for Woodstock, and it totally didn't end up coming together because uh, just like the original Woodstock, no one really wanted to host it, and they were worried it would become a an unsafe sort of drug-fueled mess. Within all this, you also get other movements that were shaped after the civil rights movement. Uh, the National Organization for Women, or NOW, is one of these groups. Uh, much like the civil rights movement pushed for increased status for African Americans, the National Organization for Women pushed for increased status for women. So uh, they're pushing back against gender roles and these sort of expectations. Uh, the unofficial manifesto of the national or the women's movement was Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, which you already read a little bit of and talked about, but it's the idea that a lot of women found the gender roles of the 1950s massively oppressive. And they pushed back against this and they wanted a different life or to have a career or to have better access to education or to you know, not get sexually harassed and you know, stuff like that. All these you know, massively unreasonable demands. The, uh, the slogan of the women's movement is uh, the personal is political. And it's the idea that uh, sexual relations, that women have been at a massive disadvantage and uh, they need to liberate themselves from the expectations of you know, just having kids and being a mother if they're ever going to get any form of equality. And so uh, one of the key pieces of the women's movement is, of course, you know, fighting for equal pay and uh, fighting for equal educational opportunities and fighting for all of these sort of legal uh, fixes. But also, of course, the Equal Rights Amendment, which was one of these pieces. Uh, the Equal Rights Amendment would have enshrined uh, sex, equal treatment by sex in the Constitution. Uh, yeah, here it is. As I open this fancy, this very um, well-designed and fancy button. And it was ratified, uh, passed by both houses of Congress, but not ratified by enough states to be put into the Constitution. And so uh, the campaign to pass the ERA is one of the major failures of the women's movement. Uh, although Virginia recently ratified it, uh, we believe it's out of the statute of limitations, and so it would have to probably go through Congress again to be put in the Constitution. So the Equal Rights Amendment fails, but right now uh, they're just they're simply fighting for it, and we'll talk more about the failure of the ERA in a lecture or two. Roe v. Wade was one of the other sort of water watershed moments within the women's movement. Uh, Roe v. Wade is uh, the constitutional, or oh, sorry, the, the um, Supreme Court case that established the right for women to have abortion. So it decriminalized abortion throughout the country and kicked off this massive fight over abortion, well, continued this massive fight over abortion that continues to these days, this day. Uh, the, the women's movement argued that the ability to control uh, their reproductive systems was an important component of women's liberation, whereas opponents of liberation are, of course, trying to argue for the rights of the unborn child. 
So uh, we're not going to get into the politics of that, but understand that this was an important piece of the women's movement when it was passed. There's a whole bunch of other movements. I'll try to post some supplementary material because you need to know that they exist. You need to know that they modeled their tactics after the civil rights movements as far as protests to develop, uh, to get public uh, um, support slash uh, notoriety, economic boycotts, and then, of course, legal challenges. So uh, there's a bunch of these movements. You, need, you don't need to know that they exist, but you don't need to know tons of specifics. Uh, Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers Movement is an important part of this. He was advocating for uh, better rights for uh, Mexican farm laborers. And uh, he was able to secure some important protections uh, through organizing strikes of the United Farm Workers and trying to unionize uh, the farm workers uh, of the United States. So you should know that. Uh, and then it kind of morphed into a larger uh, Latin American rights movement or Latinx movement. The American Indian movement was an important piece of uh, the civil rights of the civil rights era that often gets overlooked. Uh, the Native the American Indian movement, of course, is to create better civil rights for Native Americans, improve rights on reservations, stuff like that. One of the things that they did is they occupied the island of Alcatraz and apparently sent the U.S. government some beads in order to pay for it, in order to uh, you know protest uh, past treatment of Native Americans and highlight the. Uh, current status of Native Americans. Uh, the goal, again, is to uh, use this public protest to get a platform in which to point to some of the problems, specifically mismanagement of poverty on Native American reservations. Uh, the, the quote from uh, Adam Norwell here <laughs> sort of sums up uh, the feelings of the Native Americans about the status of Native American reservations. And there was another wounded knee incident, which, of course, there was. <sighs> Group of Lakota settled in settled in Wounded Knee in order to protest, uh, in order to protest treatment of Native Americans. The federal government got in, and unfortunately, some Native Americans were killed because, of course, they were. It's American history. That's how all of these events end. So this is the quote second massacre on Wounded Knee. If you're if you're interested in uh, the details of it, look it up. It's a fascinating incident in history that you probably don't need to know for this class. The gay rights movement kicked off in the 1960s, well, in 69 specifically, with the Stonewall Riot. Uh, Stonewall Hotel was a uh, sort of bar and area that catered to, uh, to a gay clientele. And uh, the police broke in and uh, to shut it down, and it led to massive rioting and clashing with police officers. Uh, that became a galvanizing cry to uh, fight for greater acceptance and rights for gay people. So uh, the, the Stonewall riot slash incident, uh, I'll, you should look it up if you're interested in it. Again, there's a lot of really complex uh, history going on here, but you just need to know Stonewall is going to kick off the gay rights movement, and we'll come back to that as we start to get other gains uh, within the uh, civil rights for, for LGBTQ plus individuals. Uh, oh, it's also, I should note, it's also the birth of the gay pride movement and the idea that like, but it's not just about gaining legal rights, but again, uh, gaining status and trying to push back on uh, a variety of misconceptions about gay people, which uh, there, there were and are a lot. We also get an environmentalist movement. Uh, there's a couple things that kicked this off. I mean, this goes all the way back to Theodore Roosevelt and his conservationism. But the modern environmental movement uh, is focused on trying to preserve the planet's natural resources. Obviously, uh, as industrialization increases, there's a series of issues and you have to balance, you know, development with preserving green spaces and also the environment. Uh, the, uh, and of course, as the human population grows, we exert increasing pressure on the planet. And so how do we safeguard resources while still uh, pushing human development forth further? Well, this is one of the issues that the environmental movement was fighting about. One of the events that kicked off this, this new wave of environmentalism was a book called Silent Spring written by a lady named Rachel Carson, that highlighted the effect of DDT on bird populations. Uh, DDT is a chemical uh, pesticide that farmers would, of course, put on their fields and that would run off into local rivers and get into fish. And it just decimated the bald eagle population. And so the idea that, like, that we almost caused our national animal to go extinct because of pesticide usage uh, convinced a lot of people that maybe we needed stricter environmental regulations. So... You've got environmental groups pushing for greater uh, protection of the environment. 
uh, in order to protect you know, a variety of different animals and habitats. Uh, yeah, and so the, the push was to clean up polluted waters. Uh, groups like Greenpeace, of course, pushed for this. Uh, Greenpeace are one of the more radical environmental groups that uh, go and chain themselves to oil rigs, etc. But you get protest movements for environmentalism as well, and this basic push that, like, maybe we should probably not have some animal have as many animals going extinct as uh, we're on the path to in the 1960s and 70s. Lastly, you get the Warren Court. Uh, the Warren Court is the Supreme Court under Judge Earl Warren, and they set a precedent for ju what's called judicial activism, which is a very broad interpretation of the law in order to, um, to make rulings and to expand, basically the Warren Court is gonna expand protections for civil rights. So. Uh, I don't think you need to know all the specific cases of the Warren Court, but of course, uh, Brown v. Board is an important one. <clears throat> but they're also going to, you know, they're also going to support the rights of the accused, and, um, and you know, so you get all the Miranda rights, uh, Map v. Ohio, uh, Escobedo v. Illinois, all the stuff that you learn about in either criminal justice or AP gov. So Warren Court is going to, as 